Okay, hello everybody. My name's David. I'm an arm wrestler from Perth, Australia. And today I have the absolute privilege of having a guest in one of my videos today to talk about everything arm wrestling training, uh, particularly with a focus on the mentality behind table time and improving holding, being the weaker guy, and just kind of everything to do with that. And I think I've got a really good candidate to chat <laughs> over all these things. Uh, he is really pushing for number one in Australia. He is arguably the second strongest ginger in the world. He's, uh, he's got practice pulling pins on myself. So you know he's legit. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's the owner and operator of Pound for Pound Armour Sling, Ryan Bowen. How's it going? Dave, thank you so much for having me on the show, man. I really appreciate that. Um, thank, I, I, I really, I love seeing chat. Whoa, there goes. Look at me using all this high tech. I love seeing channels like yours, man. Um, pop up and do this sort of thing and start to grow. I remember when I was at the exact same position, man. So I, I, I really appreciate it. And um, it's all ships are rising with the tide in the sport at the moment, and it's good to see you're on board, man. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So let's let's just jump straight into it uh, yeah. because uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on a, a lot of different things. So mm. I know yourself, you've had a about a nine year career at this point in arm wrestling. Yeah. And I've from what I've heard you talk about and reflect on your own journey, uh, you seem to categorize your training and your approach to the sport into two halves. And I would say pre-Justin Bishop and post-Justin Bishop. <laughs> yeah. Would that be That's accurate? That's a pretty good line in the sand. That's definitely a good line in the sand. There was a distinct change at that moment for sure, undoubtedly. I mean, prior to that, I was all about hand control and like super m about the the combat side of things. My ratio of effort, if there, if I could describe it that way, would would have been ninety percent about skill and execution and i never trained heavy I, I mean i had table time which inevitably was heavier in its in, in respect but i never did any heavy gym work i never did any foundation strength i never did any side pressure back pressure it was all hand wrist and pronation and chopping and tiny movements and i had immense success on the australian scene at that point in time i'd, I'd been dominating my weight category and progressing really quickly but the thing was all of Australia was pretty new at that time. So there was no established pros. So I was, I was beating people that were bigger and stronger than me, but they weren't, they were still novice arm wrestlers and amateur arm wrestlers at the time. So it wasn't until I dipped my toe in the water of professional, professional standards in the form of Justin Bishop that I was like, Oh, hang on a second. I'm lacking some elbow and yeah, side yeah. pressure. And then, yeah, the next chapter began. I, I which, imagine a, a couple points in that match, you have that very sweet feeling of busting someone's wrist just a little yeah. bit or just a little bit more. And you feel really confident, of course, at that moment. And yeah, uh, well, for them to yeah, drive through that. I think five out of the six rounds against Justin, I actually had hand control and had his wrist back. And yet I lost the match 6-0. And like, like you said, he, he just, it didn't matter. I took... I won everything that I was looking for in the hand yeah. and wrist. Like I achieved, I, I got it in five of the six rounds. And I'd never lost a match like that before, ever. And so it was a real wake up call to me to go, wow, look at that. Despite having everything you thought you needed, he still just went, ah, I'm just going to pin you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a distinct moment uh, of recognizing that um, Look, combat is always going to be a very important part of the sport and and I, I i love the philosophy of strength or combat i always say yeah i mean you can say it both ways two people of equal strength the better execution is going to win and two people of equal execution the stronger guy is going to win so you can really take it from both angles um and in the case of Justin and I, he, uh, I think I won the execution battle, and but it didn't matter. The, the, the scales were tipped too far in the strength side towards him because uh, there's obviously a point where no matter how technical you are, if you're not strong enough, that you're not going to do anything. Um, 
and you can look at greats like Richard Lovekies, who had a very simple style about them, but still went all the way to the top because they were simply so strong. And then you can look at people like Devin Larratt, who doesn't have the robustness of, of, of Richard Lovekies, yet has been all the way to the top on the back of, yes, great strength, but very superior technique. So, and then you yeah, have, I love uh, that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Then you have weirdos like Michael Todd and defies mm. explanation yeah. how he wins some matches. Well, uh, they, yeah, they, 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 they've, they've found something obscure, a weird little block that they achieved and mm. just enhanced that and took that to a level where no one knew how to get around it and no one had, no one was strong enough to get around that little block that they had achieved. So mm. th that's one of the coolest things about this sport is that there are so many ways to win it. Uh, no two arm wrestlers feel the same. I'm yet to grip two people that feel the same. Everyone's different. And, um, and that's why it's, I, I love it when you, when you meet someone brand new, they think it's quite a simplistic sport. They think that it's just the stronger guys are going to win. And you're like, whoa, 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 there's so much more to it. Um, it really it, it is. Seems uh, to, I, I, that is definitely true. And it's like, I think you go through that phase of thinking, the stronger man's going to win. Then you get top rolled infinity times and you're like, okay, yeah, there's, there's some more to it. And then you get to another level where if someone's just strong, it doesn't matter what, what you're doing, they, yeah. can, they can drive through it. And you see that at the elite levels as well, which is pretty yeah. cool. And at the, at the elite level, I would say there's actually, there's nothing more satisfying that I've personally experienced so far than beating someone in a professional arm wrestling match when you just know that you were the weaker man uh you, you and you can feel yeah. that from grip up one and you're like oh shit this guy's strong <laughs> you can feel it you're like oh i'm gonna have to put bullet holes in him all around and and try to crack this this open um and it's a real it's a real test of your ability to counter attack and 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 create deceptions and and traps and dead spaces and um, really satisfying though that the weaker man can win it, it gets harder to do that as you climb as i've climbed the ladder of the ranks because the skill level is getting higher and higher and higher as well um, like i said when i was a novice arm wrestler it was very easy to climb the ranks just by upgrading my skill because people didn't sense it but at the at the higher end of the sport uh, it's people are more subtle they mm -hmm. they read things better and they, they're prepared so you got to be both strong and, and your execution's got to be on point. So it's good fun though. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, and I've actually heard you say that sentiment of you were the weaker arm wrestler for a long time. Now you came from a background in tennis and quite a high level of tennis. Now that doesn't, that's not nothing when it comes to, I assume your right hand and your forearm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you actually realize that at the time or have you ever thought about uh, yeah, well, it's funny. That I, tennis has? I, I've, that been doing, I, I've been doing the, the, the way of the giant pumpkin for my entire life. When we mm. talk about training one arm tennis, a yeah, one arm sport, other than tossing the, the ball up to serve with my left arm, everything ex explosively in tennis is obviously done with the right arm. And, and I was very aware of its translation that a heavy topspin forehand really, I believe translates really nicely to, to, to a, a top roll, um, pronation of a top roll. It just, so I believe I came, once I committed to the sport of arm wrestling, I believe I, I could feel just the neurological efficiency in my right arm in a top roll compared to my left. My left feels really uncoordinated and feels disconnected where my right just just feels really connected um and so i yeah i believe that the tennis i, I often looked at uh, when i first started arm wrestling i'd look at people like rafael nadal and i would be like oh man he would be such a good arm wrestler put him in the lightweights i reckon i reckon yeah, that explosive yeah. yeah like but clearly arm wrestling is not playing as much as tennis so i don't think he's going to come across anytime quite, soon yeah. but yeah, yeah. But I do believe it translated. I think tennis 100% translates. And I know of a, a few other guys that have done really well in the sport that have um, that uh, are guys who turn up and have seemingly just a natural ability that's above the average guy that turns up. And, and they say, yeah, it's from my tennis. So, um, yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah. So, and just there's a last bit we're sticking before the Justin Bishop map and the match and mm -hmm. the kind of change in approach 
arm wrestling seems to be in kind of a unique spot that basically historical records for most of us new guys that are starting started like 10 years ago arm wrestling didn't mm. exist for us prior to that yeah. now thankfully like yeah. gary roberts is uploading a lot of that old content which is amazing but i can imagine when you started it was like a wasteland of content and and resources mm. uh to get yeah, into there, there wasn't much there wasn't much out there when i when i when i when i discovered the sport um it was i watched pulling john um that was probably the most uh significant piece of content that i watched that was like wow look at this this is amazing um and you what what, what was floating around on youtube was really really thin um there wasn't <laughs> it wasn't much at all um arm wars was the probably the best thing arm wars was broadcast on Eurosports at the time um which wasn't available unless you had fox foxtel in australia which i didn't have but i knew it was there and it was it was something that i was able to find i can't remember where i was finding that i don't think it was youtube because neil wasn't uploading there but but there were bits and pieces of of matches floating around and for, for me my start was all about all right well i've got no one here in australia to guide me and coach me um so i just i i literally studied john brzank's movements uh, watched mm -hmm. pulling john and went okay and then i just shadow boxed him and just tried to understand why on earth he's in those positions and tried to feel the benefit. I was I'm wrestling against bands and things like that, just just trying to work out what on earth's going on. But um, yeah, there there wasn't much compared to what we've got now. <laughs> yeah, and, and with no meaning, no offense, that sounds like an absolutely terrible way, terribly inefficient way of learning the movements and the pressures yeah. of arm wrestling. <laughs> uh, and yeah. I say that as a as before I committed and started arm wrestling. I had these ideas and concepts about what it would feel like and how strong I'd be. But until mm. you get on the table and feel certain movements, uh, particularly by yeah. experienced arm wrestlers, it's just, it's... Well, it's highlighted, isn't it? By If, if you go and watch, uh, go and look at any viral arm wrestling video where the majority of people commenting are non-arm wrestlers. And 50% of the people in there are commenting saying, it's not body wrestling. You're supposed to. You're not supposed to drop your body. It's not fair if you drop your body. And they have no concept of of being able to see and understand the pressures at all. So, mm. most a lot of people think it's just about internal rotation and nothing else. They don't appreciate how much the hand and wrist is involved and how you can be disengaged from your own power by having your hand turned palm up or your wrist opened up. And yeah, it's um. The first time you grip a pro arm wrestler, I mean, the first pro arm wrestler I gripped was Doug Fatafee. But when I say pro, I don't think he wasn't pro at the time, but he was significantly better than me. Um, and I gripped him and I just remember thinking, oh my goodness, just just felt like an immovable steel bar. And and it was and it was the hand, it wasn't the arm. It was, and that's the first thing that people it, realize is, oh, they go, wow, it's the hand. It's, it's striking the how unnatural it feels you're like this this is not what a hand uh, is meant to feel <laughs> like these pressures aren't, aren't normal i've def yeah. i definitely had that revelation when when first starting pulling um yeah yeah so after justin bishop after you got smacked really hard you mm -hmm. changed your approach <laughs> and i did i did it was strength side pressure power uh at least in by my impression off the table that became your focus in your workouts off the table i'm yep. not sure how much your table time changed in regards to that it did. but yeah yeah talk it through was, that change in approach when it came to adding on strength yeah it was, it was a, it was a big it, it was definitely a big change side pressure was the thing that i wanted most um uh, the first year after Justin, I was just making making the program up myself. I hadn't engaged with Todd Hutchins yet, but I just started going. I just started putting effort into side pressure, like really just awkward, ugly ways. I would just go to the gym and get a cable and just just try to condition my elbow. And I remember seeing Todd Hutchins make a quote that you needed 100 pounds of side pressure minimum with a with a uh, a wrist wrench in order to be national level standard. And I was really curious. I was like, oh, where's my 1RM? I, I had a go, I got a wrist wrench, had a go, and I got 35 kilos. So I was way short. 
of the standard and I was like oh man and it was my elbow that was that was really the issue it wasn't my hand it was my elbow um and I've seen that I've, I've seen other strong arm wrestlers uh people that are quite good in the hand and wrist um have a go at my they come over and train with me and have a go and really struggle with that side pressure and I, I I do believe that side pressure is probably the last of the fundamentals that you find that arm wrestlers add to their game when they're pursuing the the pro and the elite level I think the hand and wrist the back pressure comes pretty naturally but often I think I feel like the separation between high-end amateur and pro is that elbow conditioning on a side pressure sense um, so my training really did uh, it really accelerated, particularly once I engaged with Todd Hutchins, who is famous for, I guess, the side pressure king in the sport. Um, I engaged with him, and he he used the conjugate method, and we applied that to arm wrestling, which was a a, a one RM day once per week, a speed day where I'd use eighty percent of that one RM, and a volume day where I would static hold and use do plyometrics with seventy percent of that one RM. And then every other uh, other day was accessory work to just uh, support the joints and, and provide balance to the, to the muscles. But it was very specific about making heavy efforts on the elbow. And um, that's where my famous 44% uh, gains were made yep, in the yep. first few months. Vectors, all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the elbow, the elbow went, it went from 35 kilos um, up to 52 or whatever, whatever it is that gets you 44%. And, and I remember being excited by that, like significantly excited. And and to this day now, where, where I'm at, having now done it for what, uh, what is it? We three three years of really heavy side pressure effort. My, if my hand's not being threatened, I can put 80 kilos through my elbow. If it's on a wrist wrench now, I'm at 65 kilos. Um, so it, it's I, I feel like my elbow is now actually a, a greater asset than my hand. So. I got to catch my hand back up. <laughs> That's what I was about to ask. So when does the side pressure stop and the focus mm. becomes pronation, <laughs> cupping? Because I imagine John Brzezink would look pathetic in certain <laughs> movements that yeah. you're killing, yeah. but yeah. he has other I, things. I, yeah, I, 100%. And John's a great example of... Of, of of what matters most in arm wrestling. At the end of the day, John being the greatest of all time, and yet his side pressure is probably 80% of mine through the elbow if we're not threatening hand. Um, uh, and, and I mean, you'll see that. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's this, the, the end of the day, I think so the reason you only need side pressure, or you can only access side pressure once the hand position has become stable. Now, you don't need to necessarily win the hand. Like, if you look at Todd Hutchins, Todd Hutchins will happily pull palm up and wrist back. He will. He, he, he's, his in theory the is the, the worst, yeah, in a strap, the worst place my wrist can get to is here and there. Combine that. That is the worst place. If I can train and do more side pressure with my wrist like this than my opponent can with their wrist like that, I'm going to win. So Todd will literally train here in, the, in that, that sense. I don't like, I, I haven't found that same degree of success that Todd has in that theory. And I believe that's because Todd's got an extremely short forearm. He's got a 10 inch elbow to wrist where I've got a 12 inch elbow to wrist. So he's got a very, very, very short forearm. So he brings people down a long way and people struggle to, uh, to twist his thumb any further. But I find I'm, I'm, I'm a very average sized arm wrestler. I'm not tall, not short. My hands are big, my hands are small. Mm. Um, so I honestly feel like I need to be very well rounded and against good tactical top rollers. If someone like Jordan Davis, for instance, took, took my wrist, I, I can't make my hands stable and therefore my, my, my side pressure is reduced. And what I, what I say by stable is all I, all I want to know is that if I put my foot down on the accelerator to go sideways, that my hand will remain in the same condition. If when I put my foot down on the accelerator, my hand twists further at, at the same time, I would consider that not stable. And that, that is, it's that lack of stabilization in your hand that will cause you to ease up on side pressure. So, so in answering your question, when does cupping and pronation that become a priority again for me? It's when 
it's when I can, it's when my, it's when I, it's when I can't keep my hand in a stable position when I go sideways. I'm happy to pull like this. As you saw when I pulled Ryan Scott, um, that last round against him, Ryan Scott took my wrist and I was happy because I was stable. If my wrist was still twisting, uh, then I wouldn't have been happy. Um, so end of the day, the quickest, most efficient way to win is certainly to just take hand control of someone and, and pin them. But I like to be well-rounded. I want to be ready for every scenario that could possibly be thrown at me. And so I've tried to build a bit of John, a bit of Devin, a bit of Todd Hutchins, a bit of everyone into it. So, so it may be... I just be, need Jerry yeah, yeah, yeah. You may have another Justin Bishop match in the next couple of years, not specifically with Justin mm. Bishop, but that kind of yeah. moment where you're that like, kind of okay, I've got the side pressure again. I can <laughs> smash him with the side pressure. Now well, well, uh, talking of John, of John, um, I, I mean, I've I've trained with John. I've had table time with John, and John will say to me cheekily, "He's like, if we ever have a match, there's no way I'm letting you start in the straps, because he knows that if I get my side pressure down, that he struggles to finish me, and and he doesn't want to be caught up in a side pressure battle with me. But outside of straps, he can just not let me slip and just keep it about the hand." Um, and just prevent me from from doing that so which is an John incredible is already... luxury for an arm wrestler to be like yeah i'll just <laughs> keep you out of straps <laughs> yeah, so john, john has already john, john has already made me feel that way a number of times where i'm like i know my side pressure is there but my hand just will not let me use it <laughs> so but that's john at the end of the day john's the best hand there is but th th there are other people out there for instance that that do intimidate me on the hand when I grip them up. Lachlan Adair, for instance, right now, main training partner, his hand is stronger than mine and I'm unable to get my side pressure down without the constant twist happening in my wrist. The harder I try to go sideways, the more my wrist twists. And so right now for me, in my pursuit of Lachlan, I'm like, I need more wrist flexion. I need more wrist flexion. So I'm trying heavily on wrist flexion to try to close the gap on Lachlan, where if I'm taking on Jordan next, I'm, I'm not so much worried because I'm actually, I'm really comfortable pulling there with Jordan. He can't take my hand any further and I'm happy with my side pressure from there. So it, it always, yeah, depends who you're facing and who you're chasing and um, yeah, there'll be a moment. <laughs> It'll come. Yeah. So uh, you, you've spoken actually a lot, of, we've always spoken a lot about your hand and side pressure. So I'd like to kind of switch over to uh, approach to table time, um, mentally for both weaker, newer arm wrestlers and even more experienced arm wrestlers. You mm. have been known to say losing your hand is a choice. <laughs> yep. But I think that's true uh, and particularly applicable for good table time practicing. Uh, yeah, if yeah. you are the stronger guy against someone weaker uh, or if you have a stronger hand or whatever the case may be, if you can control somebody else, actually losing your hand is a valuable skill for both yourself and your opponent, I feel. Being able to control turning off a little pronation or a little cup to give your opponent more power so you actually can actually train your pronation or cup mm -hmm. more yep seems to be a good skill to have and one that i think i've observed you have in your table time against weaker guys you seem to just give up your pronation like crazy just you'll get into that <laughs> hidden hook and you'll just sit there yep. now if you want to if you're tired of sitting there you, you may turn on your pronation or just push through mm -hmm. but I, I i'm keen to hear your thoughts because to me it seems like a conscious thing that you do because it's so contrasted against your actual matches you're set up in mm. a match you'll never i've never seen you do it in a table yeah, time session like crazy yeah, yeah. aside from lachlan Adair. when you're when you're pulling with him in training sometimes i'll i'll see that but otherwise i never see it <laughs> yeah well the um yeah i guess there's a few layers there to address the the um that losing your hand is a choice. I'll start there. That that's something that I really do genuinely believe in. Of, of course, it's a bit tongue in cheek in that 
someone stronger than you in a match can take your hand and wrist against your will. I've talked about that. John can do it to me. Lachlan can do it to me. And you ultimately can lose a match. But the 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 reason I, have, I made that statement in the first place was to try to stimulate thought processes in people that there are ways and means, there are traps and dead spaces, there are diversions and opportunities, there are things you can trade in place of losing your hand that will still keep you in the match. You can just simply moving your arm and lowering your arm towards the defensive position and supinating slightly is going to prevent you from losing your wrist compared to staying rigid using side pressure and, and losing your wrist. Like in a very basic sense, that's a choice. Um, and so that's the, that was the real core of it was uh, to try to help people to discover the, the nuances of the sport. And a, a big part of my table time uh, and, and probably the first four years of my training where I did table time every day with Jordan Davis was spent at the 30 to 70% effort range where we were never taking each other's hands. We were just moving and dancing on the table and feeling positions and counters and blocks and, and building that database of positions and knowledge in, in our hands and arms. So I really do like that concept. And I think as soon as you start thinking about arm wrestling that way, you unlock a whole mm. series of, of possibilities. But that as takes, for, as for that, that takes communication and thought yeah. and time. Yeah to do that yeah. <laughs> which a lot of guys don't aren't really that keen on yeah well that's it. If, if, if you can communicate with your training partner that hey look no one's pinning each other tonight and, and to make it fun because every you need to have fun in training you need to have a sense of victory or defeat everyone's bored if they don't have some sense of victory or defeat so we made it about lactic acid we said all right and you can you can do this whether you're the weaker guy stronger guy it doesn't matter like i can do this with lachlan adair and crush him because he's terrible at like with lactic acid he really is um and what what i'm referring to is we make the rule all right no hard counters no one is allowed and by hard counter i mean no one is allowed to overpower a hard counter okay if you feel your opponent is on a hard counter you're not allowed to overpower it you can lean against it but you can't overpower it so with no overpowering hard counters at all only soft counters allowed you'll never take someone's hand and wrist unless they choose to give it. You, like it's imp If you're following those rules, you won't. And so you play that game with no hard counters, you have to try to win the arm wrestle. And you'll find that the only way you can win the arm wrestle is by filling your opponent's arm with lactic acid until they just say, I'm done, I can't, I can't keep up anymore. And to do that, you're chasing each other around, trying to keep someone on their pronator or trying to keep someone on their wrist. Or, and man it's fun it's really fun and you learn so much and you actually get to the point where not only do you learn what you're thinking about but i think you i think your hand and arm and wrist uh and your brain learns things you you didn't even know were there you couldn't have realized it you couldn't have thought it. you just feel things and start logging all these positions and yeah so it's a really beneficial way of arm wrestling i'm a massive fan of it and i do it weekly yeah. at the moment so it's always been there Second yeah, I, part of what yeah, you're asking about the about the giving up of pronation and the hidden hook. The hidden hook for me. Oh, sorry. Uh, you've just dropped out. Oh. You back? You got me back? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, I got a phone call from my dad at the time and it, it killed my microphone. Um, so, yeah, the hidden hook, two, two main reasons. That Sorry, I don't know how many times my dad's going to try to call me. <laughs> Go away, dad. Busy. All right. Priorities. We'll try again. <laughs> I didn't know that a phone call was going to do this. I apologize, YouTube. Um, but yeah, I want to be fluid for my opponent. I want one thing that I don't like is when uh, a stronger guy simply stonewalls at center a weaker guy. It uh, doesn't help the weaker guy at all. Really doesn't. Um, it, 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 it kills the mood very quickly. But being like a rubber band is really important. And so I find giving up my pronation and floating on the outside of my elbow in that hidden hook 
allows me to be very fluid for my weaker opponent. It also allows me to dance around with that same concept of filling them up with lactic acid slowly. Without, I, I never hard counter them. I'll just chase them around and fill, and they'll, they'll keep on trying to bang through and I'll just, I'll stop them with a very fluid feel. So it helps my lactic acid tolerance. It helps my ability to sense counter attacks. It helps my opponent to have good quality training despite being the weaker uh, athlete. And everyone enjoys themselves. And so that's why I do that. And then when it comes to matches, as, as you said, 100%, I will never give away my pronation. It's actually my most treasured fundamental. I feel like I've won more matches on the back of pronation than any other um, fundamental in arm wrestling. So I'll protect it like crazy. Often when I go into a ready go, I visualize a chain from my around my wrist to my non arm wrestling shoulder. I, I visually tie that freaking chain there and I say, that is not breaking. That pronation off this first surge will not get turned over. Um, it's, 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 it's where I put most of my thought in that very first second of the go is just make sure your pronation survives. If my pronation survives, I feel like I win 95% of the matches from then on. My pronation doesn't survive. Rather than it being taken off me, and this is where the old hand, giving your hand away is a, a choice. If I can feel that someone's strong enough to take it off me, I won't, I won't, I won't stay there and let them take it off me. I'll, I'll beat them to it. I'll give it to them in the form of, here, have my hidden hook. Because I still have my pronation in my hidden hook. My pronation, in, re in respect to my, the twist of my actual forearm, my pronation is still there. I've just gone to the outside of my elbow. And so it's still there, as opposed to me leaving my elbow where it is and then taking it off me. Then it's gone. So protect whatever it is you need and trade something else in its place uh, i find it funny that you said got to keep it enjoyable for both pullers i found it incredibly frustrating when you did it against me because i like <laughs> having that that you, tension oh, the heart. i, yeah, I okay. like not necessarily of course my hand being turned over and everything taken away but i like uh I uh, think Kyle Howard I pull with occasionally as well. He also does something similar where he'll give away a lot and he'll just kind of sit down there. And you're like, mm -hmm. I, I know what you're doing and you're trying to make it easier for me, but I'm just, it makes me very aware of my yeah. weaknesses. And it, yeah, well, it puts, it puts you in a very dead space, doesn't it? Exactly, and, and, yes. And, and, it's, and, and, but it, it's good that you, you're feeling that because, the, the the solution for someone like yourself in that position, I mean, I've I've had arm wrestlers do that to me when I pulled with Devin Larratt. He's done that to me as well. And I and, and what you need to to evolve to is because uh, I mean, when someone like Kyle is doing that, he's tempting you, he's baiting you to try to pin him, whether it's in a press or whether it's in hitting a top roll or what. He's baiting you. So Devin Larratt's old lesson of never take what's being given. Okay. The counter to someone doing what Kyle's doing to you is to like so if 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 he's open and you're over here like this and he's just letting you in, sit in that dead space, instead of going for it or going for it, start retracting and climbing back this way. Start actually pulling your wrist bone back and up and going away from doing the absolute opposite of what he expects you to do. Just subtly start backing away from him and he'll start to realize oh, I'm, I'm losing contact and control and then when he get like so the 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 true counter then is to make him think he has to do something you need to find a position where the lactic acid starts to trouble him and if you're sitting down there in that dead space it's it's chances not are he's him. very comfortable there yeah 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 so you get just so literally Try it. Try it. Literally start doing this, pulling yourself in this direction. It'll be really weird and confusing for him. He'll be like, what is this? What are you doing? What are you doing? And it's, uh, I, that's where I, the rabbit hole just keeps on going. When you, mm -hmm. when you spend so many hours doing this lactic acid dance, you start to discover some really cool and obscure counters. And that's one of them, that, that retracting <laughs> wrist, <laughs> retreating and retracting that, yeah. Because I think I have a, I think I have an aptitude for 
really long pulls. Generally, I just, uh, when I'm going hard, I'll just pull and I'll, I'll get pinned, you know, 10 times, but I won't let up pressure. Um, yeah. So I, I, I instinctually do that. Yeah. <laughs> I instinctually do that. I'm trying to feel for where I can be strong in virtually every position. And often that's in a losing position because these guys are just going smack, smack, mm. smack. So I'm trying to find somewhere strong. But mm. so I'm more comfortable there perhaps than in the winning side <laughs> where they're very comfortable. So yeah, I'll, yep. I'll try that. Um, I was watching a video uh, with Bob Brown and Ryan Espy um, recently that they put out about the dichotomy of arm wrestling. And Bob was talking about the fact that all arm wrestlers, you know, the most fun part is table time, is getting on the table, getting smacks, mostly smacking other people. But it's really a, not a very good way to get stronger. And having the approach of treating arm wrestling and table time more like reps and sets uh, you know, you're not maxing out every pull um, because I thought that was a fair point. In a lot of pulls that we do, we're going until one of us hits failure. We're stopping, resetting, yeah. then doing it again and again and again, yeah. <laughs> which is insane yeah. when you think about any kind. It's, you're doing a, a deload. Yeah, constant negatives and max yeah, efforts over yeah. and over and over again. Yeah, I agree. A lot of people, yeah, get caught up and, and have terribly irresponsible table time in terms of efficiency of for, for gaining strength i agree with that wholeheartedly but and they do that because it's fun and the social side of it is is what it is um i i i have tried I, I i have combined now well like where i'm at right now is i've combined the world of todd hutchins what he taught me with the conjugate method and cables and, and sets and reps with that of table time because i do believe that table time is is a a better uh, and more important uh, skill to to translate. If you can get the strength perfectly translated into to arm wrestling, it's much better than than a wrist wrench. Um, so I do a one RM day. I have three table se time sessions a week. My one RM day is with Lachlan. I will go as hard as I can for about half an hour with Lachlan. Try to pin him, get opened up, and I'll I'll put big work onto my arm. My, I will then do uh, a volume day where I consider it my static hold day where I'll visit a club in the, in the area. I'll pull for 15 minutes with, with guys that I'm stronger than and I will just hold them until they bleed out and they will just keep cycling through until I bleed out. Um, and then I have um, my skill-based day, which we described before, um, where I'm coaching and light pressures and that. So I, I try to make table time uh, as though it is an efficient gym routine. And I think that's, I think that's where, like, if that's where I'm at right now, that if I had to start again, this is what I would prescribe to myself. Three days table time, as just described, every other day, uh, a hand and wrist lightweight routine, um, 15 to 20 kilos on whatever the position and vector is that your hand and wrist needs. And um, if you can't get your table time, replace it with cables and one RMs and things like that. If you were in, uh, say, Georgia and you weren't yeah. basic, basically at the moment, it's very hard for you to find someone who's uh, comparable to your strength and skill level in Australia. Like you said, you're, I, I guess you say you, you're pretty lucky to have Lachlan to, to train with. Yeah. If you had unlimited uh, access to stronger guys, more experienced guys, mm. is there any point in not in doing any work off the table? Could you... I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm 100% I'm of the belief that table time is king and I would only do table time. If I had access to... If I had a teleport and I could go anywhere at any time to train with whoever I wanted, I would do six... I would probably do five days a week table time and I'd vary who it was with and I'd vary the intensity. But I would keep it to one day a week of maximum effort and every other week I'd have two other days. One at 80%, one at 70% and then every other day at 30%. Um, undoubtedly, arm wrestling is best with 100%. Uh, I mean, athletes, swimmers swim, tennis players get on the court. So, yeah. Yes, it's beneficial to 
get in the gym and keep your joints healthy and your body balanced and things like that, that that is a reason to be in the gym to do some external rotation and things like that. But um, in terms of making the most efficient gains in the arm wrestling sense, uh, yeah, a big believer that table time is absolutely the best. Um, conv- I, I don't think I could be convinced otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so John Brzezink seems to agree with that. He, mm. for many, many years, outside of what he considered was a good practice pool, i.e. every competition he ever went to, every tournament he went to, he has a bit of work on the arm, good practice. He, yep. he did one table time session per week. Now, mm. uh, I was also listening to an interview with uh, Mindaugas Teresitis, I think it is. Yeah. And he was saying, he's already at an elite level at a, at a young age. Mm. He was saying, well, you know, once to twice a week table time is all he thinks you, mm. you need plus patience and just wait mm. and don't, don't rush it. Give it 10 years. 10 years of doing that yeah. and you will reach an extremely high level. Now, mm. is that true? Oh, yeah. Or are these yeah. guys just incredibly well, gifted? I, so they can I do think that. There's a whole, it's all combined. It is like Devin Larratt's formula for becoming an elite arm wrestler is number one, love the sport. That'll give you that patience that Mindogas is talking about because if you don't love it, you're not going to be consistent yeah, and they'll absolutely. stick around. Um and then Devin's number two is don't get injured. And then Devin's number three is when you do get injured, remember rule number one, don't stop, just work around it. Um, I do believe that patience is uh, uh, <laughs> one of the virtues that will, that it's absolutely necessary unless you are the ultimate genetic potential like a, a John. But even John, if, if, you, if you dig dig down into why John became John, John was arm wrestling his dad and his brother he will say every single day of his life from age 13 onwards every single day he checked whether he could beat them yet and he wanted to john was the youngest and he wanted to beat his dad he wanted to beat his brother couldn't 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 Mm. couldn't until he could so john arm wrestled every day one arm wrestle every day for for years and years and years and years and then when he developed that hunger to become the world's best he did it via via traveling i mean he has 572 titles or something tournament wins to his name if you look up the history um and he did that every two weeks he'd be in another part of the world so he had an immense amount of table time an immense amount of consistency and um and an immense amount of variety in the people that he gripped and i think that's what truly made john john is john genetically the gift i think he there's there's a component to it that's John's genetically gifted and has the aptitude for it. But I do think John also was very consistent and very patient because he loved it, I think. Um, And, and I do think that, I mean, I was someone, I wasn't genetically enormous or anything like that when I started, but I certainly did love it. And I, I, I've certainly been consistent. I think if in my nine years in the sport, I haven't stopped. I, I, I just haven't. There's never been a day where I haven't, been thinking about my next armor sensation there's been days where i don't train um uh, but when i went on my honeymoon to new zealand that was the first time ever since being an arm wrestler that i've had uh, a couple of weeks off uh, it, it was very bizarre so um consistency will do it for sure I, I do think that the conditioning required to be a pro level arm wrestler does take time and um yeah this I, I do believe Mindogus, uh, if you've got the high quality table time, you've got the desire to learn the skill and you do it without getting injured every week. Yeah. You'll become amazing. Jordan Davis, another great example of that he was so weak. Actually, Jordan was the weakest I've ever met out of all newcomers to Brisbane. That's a pretty big statement. When you think about it out of 150 people I've met that have ever arm coming arm wrestle to Brisbane, he was the weakest. He could put his, I wonder how index many times Jordan has heard him say that. <laughs> yeah, and touch, he could touch his index finger and thumb. No one can do that. That's how skinny he was. Yeah. He was. He looked like a skeletal anorexic sort of thing going on. And look at him now. And what what is it about Jordan? Has he had the most amazing, efficient training? No. He's just never stopped. 
and he loves it and he thinks about it a lot and so he, and he moves well so he's developed the strengths in the areas that are the most beneficial um and because he's never stopped it's taken him to a very very high level he's i mean he's a world level guy so yeah, yeah. and i think that can be uh encouraging or discouraging depending on your mentality and certainly i know for me it's both at times on certain days yeah some days yeah. i'm like well if i just keep going <laughs> in, in in three years i'll be better much better than yeah. i am now and other other days i'm like oh three more years of just like this <laughs> I, don't know I, know, I, I, remember, I remember having the same thought and i, I remember thinking that I was lucky that I started early. I was like, oh man, this is so good. In a, like in Australia. I started early in Australia. So I got to the front of the, the queue. Now, as long as I don't stop, I should stay at the front of the queue. And so I was like, oh, this is really cool. But now, and I kind of feel sorry for people starting now who grip someone like me, who grips someone below me that I can stonewall and someone below them that they can yep. stonewall. And this newcomer's been stonewalled by this this layer down here, and they're like, "How the hell am I ever going to get up to Ryan's level, or, or even the guys in between?" And so it can be disheartening, but it is. I, I I see it and feel it in new guys in the club all the time. Guys that turned up that three months ago felt weak now feel really amazing, and you're like, "What? What three months has done of you arm wrestling once a week with the club is phenomenal." Mm. um and so it, it, it does happen and it's tricky because we're against humans so we don't instead of lifting up a bar where we know the weight we can see the progress we're convinced we're getting better we're against humans and sometimes it just feels like you're never catching anyone <laughs> but I, I i am someone my psychology on it is i'm just fascinated i don't know how high i'll get I I dare to dream as high as I possibly can all the time. Number one genius. I find that enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> I find that enjoyable to go. Hell, no, screw it. I'm going to see if I can get all the way. I want to be in the debate of could Peak Ryan have beaten Peak John? I want someone to ask that genuinely someday. And people will say that's delusional, Ryan Bowen. But I don't care if it is or it isn't. What? And I, and I don't care whether I reach that or not. But I'm fascinated by the psychology of. Well, let's see what happens. I know that I won't stop in this sport because I do love it. And it's become my career, so it pays the bills. So I know I'm not stopping. And then I'm like, well, there's a lot of longevity in this sport. So I think, I think I'm a 30-year arm wrestler at least. By the, when I look at my age and all that sort of stuff, I think, yeah, okay. So 30 years puts me at 58. That I think at 58, I'm going to be a badass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking because of, of the consistency yeah, more than anything. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of delusional, you are known as being mm. completely delusional. <laughs> but I think you've done a pretty undelusional job lately. You have shown up to every super match, some to which you had no, you did not expect were going to happen, <laughs> not prepared whatsoever. And you have proved yourself more than proved mm. yourself. You're not delusional if you correctly uh, discern your own ability and your own skill mm. level. Until you say, I am going to smack RBJ, I'm going to just crack his <laughs> wrist and then get proven otherwise, I reckon you've got a pretty good track record. I also mm. think it's a very useful skill to be able to accurately discern your level. And mm. that should be something that's encouraged. I, I feel like, for example, Chance Shaw, um, he's trying to climb the ranks. He's doing very well. And for some reason, people don't like it. People don't like it when anyone yeah. says, I see myself at a certain level. That's and, and I understand that when it's shown that they're nowhere close to that level, which does happen. Yeah. But when someone yeah. is actually just demonstrating over and over and over again that they are climbing very fast, uh, mm. That should be something that's encouraged. You should be as a good ability to have to, yeah. to see where you're at. <laughs> I agree. I did at the end of the day, I think we all agree with what you said. I think everyone agrees with that. It's but it just sometimes uh, it just it just makes people uncomfortable when you see someone say and you just for whatever reason you think 
it's a load of shit that they're accurate in their in their assessment. I, I've personally always actually had the goal. Uh, Jordan Davis, Davis will attest to this. I've said it to him right from the beginning that I constantly strive to have my my actual ability above my reputation. I want people to think my reputation's here. I want it to be here. If if it ever ends up like this, I'm like, oh, hang on a second, I'm doing something wrong. I don't want my rep. I don't want people thinking I'm up here when my reality's down there. I constantly want to be dr- dragging it up. Um, so I, I I have always I did this from the the local to the regional to the state to the national to the international to the mid pro to the upper pro. Now right now, I'm I'm. My, the delusional Ryan now is is trying to get matches with people like Zaloyev and and stuff like that and like for a lot of people that's like dude you're crazy you can't do that and where the the, the delusional thing gets mixed in with the grapevine and the internet and people misquoting and all that sort of stuff is they'll take an aspiration and a and a and a an intent to test my level as I'm gonna smash Zaloyev that's where people it gets twisted and, and people develop uh i call it a hate whatever where they think you're just an idiot but yeah the the, the proof is in the pudding as you said like my 11 super match wins if i go back and actually look at those 11 super matches i think i was the underdog in nine of the 11 and i could probably go back and find delusional historical statements about each of those matches but they they turned out the way they turned out and and yeah you keep on you keep on progressing and i i for one personally develop fastest in the deep end um i will i'll always take a super match with someone below me if they've asked for a super match with me i'll always do it because i respect that i've asked for many super matches of people that are above me on paper and um and i really am grateful and appreciate every time they do it so i'll always take one uh if anyone asks for me but at the same time, I, I have zero fear to, to, to take a loss. Um, and I actually, I actually want that. I, my, my approach is to keep finding the losses until you can't find them anymore. And if you, you start that locally, state, national, international, you just keep searching for them. And, then, and when you find them, which you will, you, you learn and you grow and, and it's cool and that's like people will look at my Zlotty tour like I think when the delusional Ryan Bowen series was at its peak was pre and post Zlotty tour where I, I went into Zlotty tour full of confidence that Todd Hutchins had given me an elbow that was ready for that and Todd Todd's was Todd was telling me John was telling me no I think you're strong enough to to do really well you could even win Zlotty and I'm, I went in with that belief and I publicly said look yeah I'm going in to win i'm gonna have i'm gonna give it a crack i believe i can potentially win zloty and i didn't win zloty and so many people that were on the anti ryan bowen train i think were hoping that i was gonna run away and hide and think that that it's all over and that that i was gonna be disheartened but to me it was like no that's cool i felt what i need to improve i'm excited to go away and improve and let's come back and go again so i was about to i was actually about to say I imagine at this point, you're kind of almost looking forward to your loss now, your, your upcoming loss, whenever it's going to happen with that person, because you're you're going to learn a lot from that. And it, I imagine it's going to give you a lot of motivation to train this 100%. and that, give you new Zlotty, ideas. Zlotty, Zlotty motivated me. You could call Zlotty another Justin Bishop moment. It was the moment it, that, that was over there wasn't a hand control moment, wasn't a side pressure moment. The moment Zlotty gave me was a center table moment. It was just, mm-hmm. you need more venom at center table was the thing. I was, the speed of starts over there. Second, sorry? Center table intimidation or? No, no, immediate access to strength from center was the thing that I felt I lacked. Um, and it was called call because of the refereeing style. They're, they're mu- there's much less load, much more aggressive starts in terms of instantaneous pressures. There's no load and squeeze. It's very just <clears throat> off the go. And so I felt, oh, okay, I'm missing that. I actually feel like if, if I had a super match with Raymond Zantanovic that night that I lost, I, I, I feel like I would have won that 5-1. That match I lost 
I lost that match that he eliminated me on, I was like, oh, I know exactly if there was a round two right now, I know exactly where I'm gripping. Um, and so I, but I lost the match as it was in tournaments. I'm, I'm undoubtedly, I'm better at super matches than I am at tournaments, but Zlotti was, it highlighted for me, if you're going to become an all-time great in this sport, you need to have this tournament ability to be sent a table and uh, particularly in that part of the world. So yeah, I, I enjoyed that. And now I can't wait to get back to Zlotti to test if what I've done to fix that problem mm. has worked or not. Um, and don't worry, delusional Ryan Bowen series, YouTube, I will once again say I'm going to Zlotti to win it when I do go there. <laughs> You're going 105 and under? Is that the goal? No, uh, right now I, I would compete at 95 kilos. Oh, right. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm 100 kilos right now, so I would, I would dehydrate to 95. And I think the strength I'm at right now and the, the upgrades to execution that I've made specific to Zlotti right now, I, don't know. I think I'm actually really good odds of winning it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I think about it, 95 Ryan Bowen. Yeah, that's pretty serious. Pretty serious. Yeah, I think. I, I, yeah, I feel like I I, I go well, uh, and th that's where that's what I was actually just really honoured recently when Igor Mazarenko contacted me and offered me a match with um, Zarakli or Irakli Zarakashvili, who's that elite level. So I, I I was just grateful that people in that region of the world see me as someone at that level now in terms of strength so mm. yeah yeah so currently we're we're all locked down in mm. uh in reality or just mm. in a potential you never know what's going to happen currently we in most of the matches that are happening are in the u.s and they mm. are social media driven matches their yeah. their names and um for example, Travis Bajant is setting up matches because he realized there's it's it's really good financial mm. structure to have a massive match, yeah. a big tournament, yeah. big, big tournament lots of eyes, that. that kind of thing. How how is that going to go once COVID frees up with WA, mm. WAL possibly coming back? Is any athlete gonna to want to do that anymore? Or I think WAL. WAL will come back. I'm wearing the shirt at the moment. Look at that. Um, I get an email once every three months or so from WAL. They, they, they touch base with all the WAL athletes and, they, and they, they reassure us all the time that they're still here. We're still in a good position. We still have sponsors ready to go. We're just waiting and biding our time for the right opportunity to, uh, we, they, they want a fully fledged season. Uh, they don't want bits and pieces. So um, I don't know when they come back, but they are keeping reserves so that they can um when it comes to will the athletes want to do it will the organizations do it i do think there's whether they want it or not there's an evolution now in in the fact that for instance you're not going to get devin larrett on a five-year contract for exclusive wal you're not gonna get michael you're not gonna get anyone none of the guys that are making social media money and devin devin's earnings are about 100 to 150k a year now just from youtube so um and that's growing fast so you're not going to get it because WAL was never even paying that much. Um, they're paying a lot less than that. So, and they were tying people up for five-year contracts. So big leagues are going to have to evolve into event-based contracts only, uh, single single event-based contracts. And I'm sure the Devon Larrets and everyone else in the world will still be in, in keen to do it because at the end of the day, organizations like the WAL make the sport look more professional than anything else. Like it's much better than being in a garage at Juju Mufu's house or something like that. Where like even though yeah it's cool you still get the views, it doesn't give the perception of the sport being a legitimate professional sport. Um, where WAL does that really well, PAL does that really well. Um, so yeah, those organisations will be back and the athletes will go back to it as well. But they they but is will. There a, they is won't there any money in it for WAL? Part of the reason why this mm. new system works so well is yeah. because there's no massive overhead costs the athletes get yeah. paid and mm. people in the, their matches that people want to see pretty much straight away mm. um yeah yeah I, I i agree with you wholeheartedly this was this is this is the business model that i live so i i i agree with it totally i love the fact that i don't need a league 
all I can do is get an agreement from an athlete on the other side of the world, go there, pull them, and it'll it might, my cost will be covered by my YouTube channel. So mm. I agree with you completely. Um, monetarily, I, I think there's still uh, – the WAL will still get enough eyes. At the end of the day, where WAL makes their profit is their third-party sponsors. So as long as the third party sponsors still believe they're getting the value, then it's going to happen still. So I, I, yeah, it'll, the, the eyes will still be there. They just may need to evolve as to how they, they, they deliver it, whether it's, whether they start going on YouTube themselves or live pay-per-views. Uh, I mean, the pay-per-view model has been their model so far today, but it's always been a little bit, a little bit hit and miss. I think the wider audience now is expecting, um, to be able to watch Dev and pull without having to jump through too many weird little hoops. So they'll evolve. But well, I think King of the Table uh, was a big, big point in arm wrestling history for that reason. It was the first pay-per-view that I bought. Uh, and yeah. certainly going forward, I, I'll almost certainly buy WAL. But prior to that, I hadn't watched any of them. Mm. And that was partly because uh, I didn't know any of these pullers. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. And it, yep it was kind of hard to get excited about the matches if you didn't know, especially yeah. the middleweights, the lightweights, no clue who these guys yeah, are, yeah. unless <laughs> you are really into arm wrestling. In my view, that's largely on those athletes themselves. Like mm-hmm. it or not, yeah. I think you have to market yourself. You, yeah, you have 100%. To have people yeah. know you it's exist. A this day and age, it is the, the the responsibility lands almost squarely on the athlete to build their own brand. Um, I got I got the call up to WAL because I had I had brand. That's the biggest reason. Neil Neil said to me, who's the chief selector of matches, he he said I always he said I was just waiting for you to get to the standard of arm wrestling good enough, and you were always going to get the call because I knew you had brand and I knew you marketed well and I knew you could you could build a storyline. Um, so Neil, so it was, and it was my bottom eight match was when I beat Evan Burgoyne that Neil went, okay, you're at the standard now, you can have a match. Mm. Um, so yeah, I and a lot of people when I was first invited to the WA, a lot of other arm wrestlers that were better than me in North America in particular uh, were left with a sour t- taste in their mouth because they were like, I'm better than Ryan Bell, why the hell haven't I got a call to WA? So yeah, the, the building brand is a big thing. And social media, uh, yeah, the COVID and the, the travel restrictions and the lack of events has, has almost uh, in, uh, been a catalyst to a rapid growth for, for that exact thing. And mm-hmm. I think that's been a good thing. And sport has done well in its evolution over the last two years. And um, it will be fascinating to see how the big organizations come back and with all gels back together. So I think uh, just to, to wrap that up, Say you have 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. I think it's fairly commonly known that a lot of people hate watch and the haters <laughs> will watch every yeah. single thing you put out. Whereas the, yeah. guy, the, the fans will watch what they're interested in. They'll pick and choose and they'll be like, oh yeah, that interests me. <laughs> so even yeah, if I, every I, one of those 50,000 people hated Ryan Bowen, you're going to get a good uh, number of them if you get the right matchup of a fan favorite against Ryan Bowen mm. that is massively yeah. financially viable well, that's, for the people that are that, making that match. That's, that's Logan Paul and Jake Paul, isn't it? That's mm. that's they they're the epitome of, of being hated and 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 yet getting enormous consistent views. Um, but yeah, I, of course I, you don't <laughs> want to be in that position. I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying that that's an element <laughs> yeah, no, that athletes need I, to consider. I, 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 I've I've come to to really be comfortable with uh, with people disliking me, with people disliking my journey, with people disapproving of my goals, or whatever. Um, I'm very used to it now, and and although it does evolve as as you grow, you you get a new wave every now and then. You get a new wave of a new new flavor of disapproval, and it takes a while to adjust. But yeah, I I, I funnily enough, like literally every YouTube video I upload, um will have maybe five to seven thumbs downs on it be like 20 seconds in into it being posted uh, <laughs> no matter what no matter what it is that you can count on those thumbs down straight away they'll be there <laughs> oh, i was gutted so, when i got my first thumbs down 
still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny thing. No, I, but it, like I said, the seasons come and go. As long as you're consistent, treat it as much as you can, like water off a duck's back. Mm. You'll grow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, social media and a career on social media and building your brand. I've helped a lot of different people with it. I helped Devin Larratt before when, when Devin was kicking his channel off. I helped him a lot. I helped Michael Todd a lot. I helped Matt Mask get his started. Um, and I've, I've spent countless hours with various athletes talking about how to do it. And, and it's the same as what we were talking about in the arm wrestling before. Consistency. <laughs> Patience. Mm -hmm that's it be yourself in those those two things and you'll you'll get there i i always treated it like you know how you might have heard me saying we were talking about losses before that there might be a hundred losses between where i'm at right now and me being an all-time great mm -hmm. so let hell let's rack up those hundred as quick as we can it's the same in social media there might be a hundred videos where you're dying on the inside feeling oh shit that's an awkward video i can't believe i put that out might be a hundred of those between you starting a YouTube channel and it being what pays your bills at the end of the day. So rack up the videos. <laughs> so nine years in, 21 years to go, apparently, for a solid 30 year career. <laughs> what is the, what's the goal over the next, say, five years? You've come, I would yep. say, exceptionally far in the last two. What's in the next five years? Five years is be uh, in the next five years. I want to be recognized as I want to, I want to be recognized as number one in the world in my weight category, which is what it won't be more than one of five by that time. But I might, I might, I might have surpassed that. Like I, I really believe I can be the world's best at my weight. Uh, and that's, that's the real goal for the next five years is to push for that. And, then once I, once I believe I'll achieve that, <laughs> once I've done that, it's then, all right, regardless of weight, how high can I get up the overalls? Like that's what Hermes Gasparini is doing right now. He, he conquered his weight category probably three to five years ago. And now he's saying, let's, let's just see how high I can get. He's 115 kilos. He's not, a, he's never going to be as big as Levan, but he wants a crack anyway, kind mm -hmm. of thing. So that, that will be the chapter that goes after that. And, ultimately the goal is i want to be recognized as one of the all-time greats in the sport and uh yeah just that's it just want to keep on going forever yeah, so <laughs> Do it till I die. when you made that announcement i think it was this morning about travis setting up a match i was convinced that it was going to be rbj i thought travis is gonna it's gonna be an american puller someone you have some kind of you know, comparative maybe you've spoken about them I was convinced it was RBJ. So I was wrong. Is RBJ uh, someone you want to have a match with? Or, depending on the, how the match goes with Sasho, mm. does that change things? If he gets smashed by Sasho, do you no longer, are, are, are you bulking up? No, you're not coming I, down. I, 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 I want a match with anyone that's in that caliber. RBJ. Uh, is 17 year at the elite level. Mm. Um, so I, I don't want the match with RBJ because it's RBJ. The same reason I don't, I don't not want a match with RBJ for any particular reason. But I'm not particularly hunting RBJ. Or and I, I think we'll get a match at some point because the story will demand it. I think that WAL may eventually, if they do pop up. If, I think by the time WL pops up, I think North America will largely agree that actually Ryan and RBJ should happen because there'll be there'll be tension, there'll be fireworks, there'll be a lot of shit talk, and that's good. <laughs> that's good for that's good for eyes. Mm. At the end of the day, so RBJ, the match with RBJ is a tough match. The dude's got a monstrous hand, huge wrist flexion and pronation ability because of the size of his hand, combined with a massive bicep. So. In a fundamental sense, there's no way I can match him that way. But in this same sense, I'm convinced that dude does not have the elbow integrity that I've got. So what will determine the match, in my opinion, is who gets in their lane. If he can get it in his lane, yeah, he'll win. If I can get it in my lane, 
I'm not letting him out of that lane and we'll stay there until his elbow gasses. So it, it's, it's a, it's for me, a match with RBJ, I think it's inevitable. Um, I'm not pushing for it, but I think it'll naturally come about just because yeah. there's too much story there. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to see it. I want to see it. Uh, <laughs> so just to, to finalize, you were going to have a match. Uh, good old COVID, it's shut down everything. You were going to have a match with the New Zealand number one, Massey Moreno. Yeah. yeah. And that was going to be a good match. I think I think that was going to be a really good match. When this opens up, you have arguably just three people left in Oceania for you. Mm. Seems like Ben Carroll is not yep. interested in Australians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, that's the vibe he's, just, he's just not interested so yep. let's just assume that continues there's only two people yep. <laughs> Lachlan Adair yeah. and the Beast from New Zealand yep. so yep. I assume the Beast is first yeah the, the, the Beast was first Lachlan is meant to face Ben uh, he's been, they've been, Lachlan's been back and forth with Ben trying to get this to happen and Ben even dismisses Lachlan, which is like, come on, dude, seriously. Like, watching the, I feel so much for Lachlan. He has been, he's not had a match since 2019. He's been training so hard and so consistently. Yeah. He's in such good form. And no one will give him a damn match. And he, and he peaked, peaked for Milkman. And, uh... He peaked for the Milkman. He literally was in his backyard. And yeah. then the anyway, Premier wouldn't let him leave. Oh, man. That was, yeah, I do feel sorry for Lachlan. I, 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 on the Ben Carroll thing, I honestly only think Ben can di be dismissive for so long. Like if he, if, if he, if he, if he doesn't end up coming to over the top, then for me, he no longer, I, I won't hold him up as a number one. I, I immediately say, well, you're now below Lachlan, Matsara, Rangi, and myself, and now you have to prove otherwise. At the moment, I still say, no, Ben's up there, but. If it carries on for too the long, the whole yeah, yeah. then I change the opinion. Um, Matt Rangi, I want to match with him. I think, um, yeah, I think that'd be a great match. I honestly really do. The dude, I actually, I, I love that we were going to have that match uh, and that the international arm wrestling scene was starting to recognize Matt Rangi's presence um, because the Southern Hemisphere doesn't often get held up. Australia's often been laughed at as an arm wrestling nation. Um, where we have legitimate dudes, and Matt Sarang is, is absolutely one of them. Um, so that match will happen when the borders do open up again. Uh, we'll have that match. Um, so we don't know when. <laughs> we just got to wait and see. But we, we still intend to have that. And then the Lachlan and I thing, we, we ultimately don't want to do that until we've ticked the boxes of the other guys. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and, and it's 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 an awkward one as well. Like we we you, you I think might not even want him. that match for two years. Pull some other people, yeah. go international, establish yourself. Well, let's see. Like, like Lachlan would love to go and pull Todd Hutchins or yeah. something like that. That's what Lachlan or he would want to pull Todd or Crassy or uh, Marcio or someone. That's what that's what Todd wants. I mean, that's what Lachlan wants. Lachlan beating me it, it doesn't help him on an international level much at all. And, go, and oh, we've yeah, seen we him we've, we've seen him beat you so many times in practice. There's not <laughs> there's not the it's satisfaction not of seeing Ryan Bowen get crushed. Where where Lachlan Adair beating any of those names that I just mentioned yeah, yeah. is a real big deal. It's like, oh shit, okay. I guess the Aussies were right that they were saying that he's at that level. So I I, I take my hat off to Lachlan for how patient he's been. <laughs> Yeah, He's especially especially since he committed so heavily to arm wrestling just about the time mm. yeah. <laughs> everything yeah. Yeah. As well. <laughs> I'm committing full time to this thing that I won't be able to do for a very long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I don't know, but I, I I actually have a feeling that um like I'm getting these offers at the moment. Like the offer from Travis to go and pull the winner of John and Paul. I got offers from Igor to pull Zarakli. All these things of uh, such significant offers that I naturally, of course, say yes to in my mind without hesitation. But then it's like, okay, the logistics, can I get there? I don't know whether I'm going to be able to get over to Washington in December. I just don't. And I've got to find out whether it's possible. But 
my feeling, especially for Lachlan, given that he has a job and he can't travel and do the two weeks quarantine and all that sort of stuff, and maybe for myself as well, is that the next significant match that happens for us will be uh, someone coming to Australia um, that is of that caliber. Mm. I'll pay for their flight to get them out here and we'll have the super match here. Um, I don't know. I don't know when this two week quarantine nonsense ends and all that sort of stuff, but the one, one silver lining to all this we have is that Levan Saganashvili is due to arrive in Australia in, I think, mid September. That's crazy. 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 <laughs> What, Australia what if, of what, all what places. If, if, yeah, I couldn't believe it. That that it's a funny one because that there's no one's bigger and stronger out there in the arm wrestling world than Levan. Um, it's a big opportunity for Lachlan, even in a training sense. He had the ability to for, to demonstrate any degree of like if he's if there's any degree of balance any degree of genuine work required from Levan, people are going to go, Oh shit. Okay. So, and especially given that Levan will be peaked as well. Levan will be two weeks after his match with Dave. So it's not lazy. Haven't been working Levan. It's just finished my big yeah. match with Dave. Jack, Levan. So. <laughs> and I believe Levan says his left is stronger than his right, which is the same for Lachlan. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, that that used to be the case. That was that was the case prior to Lachlan going all in on arm wrestling. Oh, okay. um, since going all in on arm wrestling, and given that his main training partner is me, yeah, yeah. he's done ninety percent of his work on right arm. <laughs> so he'll say now his right arm is much stronger. So. Yeah. Well, we're all really excited about Levan. Hopefully, it happens. <laughs> There's fingers crossed for once yeah, that it, something happens in things, Australia. The amount of things that have been cancelled in the last two years has just been ridiculous. We can't have another one cancelled, but yeah. yeah and I really feel you, you in Lachlan's pain. I hope your next like five matches are not with each other, but with real <laughs> elite people out there. And you build yeah. up a storyline and you really match for the number one in Australia. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, yeah. 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 But I wanted to thank you having a chat uh oh, it's been pleasure, great man. fun really appreciate it really appreciate hearing your insights and uh yeah hope to see you pulling some big boys pretty soon nice man thank you for having me on the show i i, I genuinely enjoyed this conversation too this was this had a flavor and an angle about it that i've never experienced before so i like what you're doing dave you got something unique and uh high quality stuff man thanks so much have a good night ryan all right see you guys see ya